Well, today's passage marks a new section in the book of Acts. If you remember back at the beginning of his gospel, Luke told Theophilus that the reason he wrote it was so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, having established the events and evidence for Christ's life, death and resurrection in his, his gospel, for the, uh, also the events around the rapid growth of the church in Jerusalem in the book of Acts, the spread of that gospel to the Samaritans and the Gentiles, and the church is planted by the Apostle Paul in major towns and cities in the Roman Empire. He devotes a great deal of this last section of his book to, life, to Paul's life as a prisoner on remand. In today's passage, he is put in chains, and for the remaining seven chapters of this book, Paul is under lock and key. He plants no new, ch new churches, uh, nor does he plant nor does he preach in any more synagogues. We don't even read of anyone coming to faith in Christ through him until the last few verses. What we have are the events surrounding Paul's five trials and hearings uh, while he waits to face the emperor himself. So why does Luke keep telling us? Uh, Paul's story. I mean, why not switch back to one of the other apostles? Someone like uh, Peter or John. I mean, some of the apostles travelled a really long way away. You know, can have Thomas and his exciting journeys to India. Well, Thomas never came back. He was killed out there. So it's difficult to tell the story. But wouldn't their ministries be more interesting? Well, Luke, as the only Gentile New Testament writer, is investigating his... Uh, inviting the world to render a verdict not just on Paul but on the gospel he serves so over the next few chapters you will see Paul be accused of various offenses that are still leveled at the gospel today maybe you're familiar with the series of debates that the Christian mathematician John Lennox has been having with various atheist academics over the, the last uh, 10 years so Richard Dawkins twice Christopher Hitchens twice the singer and uh, several others seeing commonly debated questions explored by intellectual giants with opposing views can really help to clarify the issues and bring the truth to life and answer people who put similar questions to us i'll uh, put a link to that series of debates on uh, the facebook page or and i'll stick it in uh, dear grace church uh, it's well worth a watch uh, well paul's defense to these accusations in these courtroom dramas recorded for us by Luke equips us to respond uh, to those questions. Accusation for this week and next week is in verse 28. Uh, have a look at verse 28. There's uh, this riot going on. Sorry, we're in uh, Luke uh, chapter 21. Um, go, and, go and find it. If you're using uh, church Bibles, that's on page 1058. Uh, have a look at verse 28. Uh, he's there, in, Paul is there in the temple, minding his own business, uh, going through a kind of Jewish religious ceremony, and some bloke yells out, fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man, pointing at Paul, who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place, the temple. And besides, he's brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place or in other words the accusation is that christianity and paul in particular is anti-semitic he's against the jews against the temple and against the law of moses it's not true but even the jewish christians in jerusalem had believed this lie about paul and uh, the churches he had planted so have a look at verse 21 um, the uh, for Acts chapter 21, not Luke 21. Uh, have a look at verse uh, 21. Uh, uh, the disciples, the, the, the elders of the church in Jerusalem say that these thousands of Jewish believers have all been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. Wasn't true, but they, they've, uh, there have been widely, uh, 
that there's been this fake news generated about Paul and his churches saying that they are anti-Jewish and uh, encourage people to dispense with following the law of Moses and, uh, uh, and is against their Jewish culture. There have been widely publicised problems with anti-Semitism in our own time, of course, uh, in various uh, UK institutions, especially when people hold the nation of Israel to a much higher standard than the other nations in the region. And this draws the accusation that uh, their prejudice against Jewish people. Um, now, that's a really interesting question to, to look at, but this sermon isn't about trade unions or political parties. It is about Paul's gospel, about the gospel that I believe, uh, uh, and, and looking at, actually, does that produce people who are anti-Semitic? Anti-Semitism ought to be impossible for a Christian, just by definition. A Christian is someone who worships Jesus of Nazareth as God, a Jewish man whose family tree is publicized in the Bible. We, we know it to be thoroughly Jewish, descended from the line of David, who was circumcised at the temple, kept the law of Moses throughout his life, taught regularly in synagogues, and was addressed by many, many people as rabbi. The Bible teaches that he ascended bodily into heaven. And is still a human being, glorified, but still human. So Jesus is still and forever a Jewish human being. A Jew will come again to judge the living and the dead, and reign eternally at his Father's right hand over all nations. And Christians look forward to his kingdom with eager expectation. That, that is our hope. Every writer of the Bible, apart from Luke, is an Israelite. Paul was Jewish, and so were all the disciples. Uh, so a Christian anti-Semite ought to be as likely as a fish who hates water. You just can't have it. You just shouldn't be able to have it. We depend on a Jewish man. We worship a Jewish man. But tragically, there have been Christians who have said most shockingly evil things against the Jews. And it'd be nice to pretend that they were only claiming to be Christians. They can't really be Christians. But most famously, Martin Luther, late in life, called for Jewish homes and synagogues to be burned and every trace of their culture erased. This is both utterly wicked and ridiculous. I'd like to pretend that he was alone in that sin, that he was some outlying anomaly but there have always been people who somehow both worship Jesus while at the same time illogically hate Jewish people. Here Paul represents authentic Christianity and stands in condemnation of Luther's error and anyone like him. It's too long a passage to, uh, to do all in one go so this week we'll look at the circumstances leading up to the accusation and next week we'll look at Paul's speech to the angry mob as uh, he explains his own life and, and what he's doing there. So uh, here's the first point. This is 10 to 14. Gospel demands love for Jewish people. Uh, the gospel actually demands love for all people um, but we don't want to get into a whole kind of all lives matter debate we we see in the bible a clear priority in paul's mind for the jews he'd written the letter to the romans only a few weeks earlier and at the beginning of chapter nine he writes this i have great sorrow and uneasing anguish in my heart for i could wish that i myself were cursed and cut off from christ for the sake of my people those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, covenants, receiving of the law, temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Uh, so Paul goes as far as saying, look, if I could miss out on heaven so that my people could be saved, the bulk of whom had rejected Jesus. Uh, 
many had uh, become Christians, as, as we'll see, but, but the bulk of whom had rejected Jesus. He said, look, I, I'd do it in an instant. I'd swap my salvation for theirs. Paul had been warned in uh, verses 10 and 11 that we kind of skated over a little bit last week. Uh, what would happen in Jerusalem? Yet he continued his mission to Jerusalem to bring the money for Jewish poverty relief that he'd raised from Gentile churches. So have a look in uh, verses 10 and 11. After we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will, will hand him over to the Gentiles. So here's this guy, Agabus. We've met him earlier in Acts. And uh, he comes on. Apparently, everyone's coats were kind of uh, lying to one side or, or, or on a coat rack. I, I don't know. I don't know. But he went and picked up this belt. Uh, and, uh, you know, Agabus, um, he has this thing uh, in this dramatic way that Old Testament prophets often did, acted out this uh, uh, dramatized version of uh, what was going to happen. He tied himself, his hands and his feet, and he says, look, whoever owns this belt, and Paul, of course, and his buddies knew that that belonged to Paul, is, uh, is going to be tied in this way in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, you see how, uh, how the, the people there responded. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, but Paul is determined. Uh, back in Romans, just a few weeks earlier, he'd uh, sent a prayer request to the church in Rome. Uh, this is chapter 15, verse 31. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea, that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. Now, this is so important. All this money had been given, but how will it be received by the church in Jerusalem? Will it be misunderstood in some way as maybe showing off or patronizing, maybe a bribe or as it truly was, an expression of genuine love from adoptive brothers and sisters, those who are in God's family by birth. So Paul would not be put off. Uh, verse 13. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When he wouldn't be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. How very much like his Lord he has become, isn't it? We shouldn't think this is strange, is it, that he would be willing to lay down his life for the sake of the gospel. That shouldn't be unusual. As soon as we realise that we are eternal creatures, our souls live on beyond death, and so do those of unbelievers. We think, okay, that's so tragic for them to enter eternity without being in a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus. That actually, the, uh, to, to shorten our mortal life for the sake of other people's eternal life, is entirely sensible isn't it if if that is the the trade that we are offered that is only right and proper that is wise and sensible and that is what paul wants to do for the sake of winning over uh, fellow jews he's willing to die secondly the gospel demands second thing the gospel demands warmth and friendship across ethnic and cultural barriers and obviously this applies to the relationships between Jews and non-Jews, but this is wider as well. Now, remember, in those days, there were no telephones or Zoom meetings. I mean, you could always write a letter, but there was no postal service. Uh, if you wanted to get a letter to someone in a far off uh, place, uh, you'd have to find a traveller who is going that way. And uh, he'd have to be trustworthy uh, to uh, actually deliver it to uh, um, yeah, not break confidentiality. And uh, uh, yeah, you, so you'd give it to them and they'd have to actually walk there or sail there or, or something like that. Uh, and it would take time. And uh, 
it's understandable or, or they'd have to just pass on a, a message verbally people would seek out travelers and merchants and say look what's it like in that city have you met that person is do you have any news about this particular thing that's going on there and uh, it's understandable that news from paul's churches might have got a bit bubbled as it was reported in jerusalem particularly if there's part of you that assumes that all those foreigners all those non-jews will be getting faith in god wrong anyway that there might have been that assumption that prejudice whatever misunderstandings there may be they are given a warm welcome and hospitality are they well, verse 15 they're put out, up in someone's house to stay verse 12 um, when we arrived at jerusalem brothers and sisters received us warmly now we must be willing to give people who are different from us the benefit of the doubt let's read on verse 18 the next day paul and the rest of us went to see james and the elders were present paul greeted them and reported in detail what god had done among the gentiles through his ministry uh, this was not paul's first meeting with james the leader uh, the lead elder in the jerusalem church there had been previous meetings that we know about, at least three, um, but it had been years since their last meeting. Both men had been tremendously used by God in different ways over that time and are surrounded by the fruits of God's blessing. But Paul is there, it's flanked by his Gentile traveling companions who all now serving the Lord Jesus and also by the substantial gift of money that the Gentile churches had given in response to Paul's ministry. And James is flanked by many thousands of Jews who've become followers of Jesus. And yet there's no rivalry or nitpicking. I mean, this should go without saying, shouldn't it? But it, you know, it doesn't always. Uh, have a look at the beginning of verse 20. When they heard this, they praised God. Uh, here are people who are expressing the love of God for one another, appreciating God's work through other people. Some are Jewish, some are Gentile, all are cherished by each other. Now, sometimes these sorts of friendships can be hard. They might be language barriers, different expectations of friendships, uh, different tastes in music. I mean, I've uh, at various times I've had uh, uh, Arabic friends and tried to get on with Arabic music. I just can't. I can't get to grips with it. I don't know really what I'm listening to. I've, I've never managed it, but we must try. Uh, when I visited India, you find grown men that I make friends with and we want to, they want to walk around the market, us holding hands. And, you know, I never realised quite how British and reserved I am. And so we want to walk around holding hands with grown men through the marketplace. Uh, but, you know, you've got to make the effort, haven't you? We live in a culture that values virtue signaling over actually being virtuous. And we have a similar problem in the church where sometimes we value having right theology over actually trying to put it into practice. There's no point saying that you believe in the grace and forgiveness of God if we are not making every effort to grow in those virtues as you follow the Lord Jesus and develop deeper and stronger relationships with one another, particularly people who are different from us, uh, that, to, to break down those cultural barriers, uh, to be united with one another, to bring it back to the Jew-Gentile relationships, to have meaningful friendships across that divide. Whichever side of it you're on, you will have to have conversations where you humble yourself and listen while you hear a perspective on things that challenges you very deeply. Sometimes this is easier uh, across racial barriers than across barriers of class or that divides according to who, what, how people vote or something like that. Will you value and cherish people who are very different from you? Well, it may be hard, but the gospel demands it. At Christmas time, we sing a carol, uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And there's, there's a line in that, talking about Jesus. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus 
are Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And just think, you know, sometimes we might hesitate to go and hang out with people that we find difficult or, um, you know, to go if it involves going to live in a slum or spend uh, time doing things that you're not comfortable with. But remember, Jesus left heaven. He is God and came to earth to live with us in all our sin and muck. And I think if anyone had a right to be a snob with us, he did, didn't he? Pleased as man with man to dwell. So if we are following him, if we're his disciples, we will let go of our snobbery. We will forgive one another. We will grow in greater friendships with one another. Thirdly, the gospel demands flexibility on issues of culture and style for the sake of unity. Okay, flex on sec secondary issues. Um, have a look at verse 20. Uh, when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? And all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews uh, who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What should we do? They will cer certainly hear that you have that you have come. So here's what's going on uh, in Jerusalem. The gospel has been preached to Jewish people and they have found as they trusted Jesus in the, as the Messiah that they've been waiting for, as they search the scriptures and realize that Jesus fits those, um, those prophecies like our finger uh, fits our fingerprints. Uh, they've embraced the Lord Jesus and the law that has prophesied them and, and uh, uh, typified him for so long. They, they've grown in their love for the law. Uh, the, so they, they practice the law of Moses, they practice their Jewish culture, knowing that Jesus is the one who fulfills it, and they delight in it. And so they hear that, uh, here's this bloke called Paul that we don't really know, he used to live around here, but now he's, he's gone off somewhere. Who's, and they're told he urges Jews to abandon the law, to turn their back on it. Like He, he doesn't believe in it. Uh, and it's tr it's untrue. That's not what he says. What he actually says is Gentiles, because they're not because nobody is saved through keeping the law. It just points to Jesus. You're saved through trusting Jesus. Let's not force Gentiles to abandon their whole culture and convert to Judaism in order to be Christians, which is something that they all agreed on. Um, uh, but uh, uh, but so false information has got around in, uh, in in the church in Jerusalem. It's been the, the, uh, the leadership know this isn't right, uh, whether they knew it before or it took this conversation with Paul to uh, for, for everything to be clarified. It's not explicit, um, but uh, there is this problem. And so uh, 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 James has a solution. Verse 23, so do what we tell you. Uh, there are four men, with us who have made a vow take these men join in their purification rites and pay their expenses then they can have their heads shaved then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law so this is a bit of a pr exercise he doesn't want people to misunderstand and think that paul is anti-jewish or anti the law of moses Say, look, here are guys, they've taken a Nazarite vow. Part of that is getting their heads shaved. There's various offerings to, uh, to, to make at the temple. If you go and you're actually sponsoring them and joining in, that'll lay all those rumours to rest. And they'll, they'll see that you are still proud of your Jewish heritage and that you're in favour of the law of Moses. You're not trying to apply it to Gentiles, but... You're encouraging people to still, Jewish people, to still enjoy and live out their Jewish culture. Um, and uh, uh, verse 25, as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, uh, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. So Paul is being asked 
to be flexible for the sake of uh, Jerusalem Christian sensibilities and Gentile Christians in the wider world have already be, been asked to flex uh, themselves in, uh, for the sake of unity, not to do things that particularly wind up uh, people who've grown up under the law, law of Moses. Uh, there are still uh, Jewish Christians today, Christians who uh, are ethnically Jewish and thoroughly uh, immersed in their Jewish cultural identity. This is a uh, uh, Jewish uh, skull cap uh, given to me uh, by a friend of mine, Craig. And uh, I met Craig when he was a, uh, an Orthodox uh, Jew. Uh, and he started dating a, uh, a Christian girl. And uh, they, uh, they were very much in love, but knew they couldn't uh, start a family together or any, anything like that with uh, very different views on uh, who God is and how he should be worshipped and how they should bring up their kids. So they promised that they would make a, a, a genuine uh, investigation of each other's faith before they broke up. And uh, uh, Craig happened to be uh, somewhere where I was, I was preaching and we had a great conversation and we became good friends. And uh, uh, through his church back home in Nottingham, uh, he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and interestingly, his, his girlfriend, Alette, uh, converted to culturally to Judaism and Craig remained thoroughly Jewish in his culture and received the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. We, we call people like that messianic Jews, thoroughly Jewish and worshipping the Lord Jesus, thoroughly Jewish and thoroughly Christian at the same time. So uh, Catherine and I went to, uh, went to visit them one weekend and we celebrated Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath uh, 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 celebration uh, it, as a household on uh, the, the Friday evening. And it was a great privilege. And uh, he, he gave this to me then. Uh, and there are plenty of uh, uh, Jewish Christians around the world. I mean, one of my scientific heroes, James Tor, is a Messianic Jew. Um, uh, thoroughly Christian and thoroughly Jewish. And there will be cultural differences. Um, and uh, and they are to be cherished and uh, and rather than having separate churches it's always far more healthy to be flexible uh, on secondary matters to incorporate one another to maintain that unity um, just think if if Jesus was willing to become a human being to become vulnerable to go to the cross in order to include us in his unity I mean come on we can make the effort for one another, can't we? Uh, Paul is here uh, uh, joining in the, the, uh, the temple uh, sacrifices uh, uh, in order to uh, put the uh, Jewish Christians' minds at rest. So verse 26, the next day Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. This is brave, isn't it? He's, uh, in, in fact, he's giving notice of where he will be at a certain date. It's not a safe thing for him. It's, it's a risky thing. Uh, but uh, he knows that uh, unity of God's people is what matters most of all here. Uh, verse 27. Uh, when the, the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia, so where Paul had been for a long time, was he was pastoring uh, in Ephesus. Uh, so, uh, he saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. Not true. Uh, but that's, what, that's how they'd understood it, or that's how they were presenting it. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They'd previously seen, seen uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul, and had assumed, wrongly as it turns out, that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now, obviously this is a, a racist accusation, uh, just saying, look, the problem is, you know, Gentiles are so filthy 
that if they come into the temple, they defile it. But just understand, it hadn't been that long earlier that they'd suffered horrific persecution uh, from Gentiles. Gentiles means Greek people and uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had uh, uh, desecrated the temple, killed many, many people uh, just for carrying on their Jewish culture. And so it was very precious to them. The idea that Greek people should be brought into the temple to desecrate it once more was something they were very, very uh, sensitive about. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Imagine how terrifying it was, would be. There would have been thousands of people in the temple courtyard there. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut so he couldn't get back in. Uh, while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was an, in an uproar. Here at once, uh, he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Okay, two chains, one for his hands, one for his feet. Exactly what Agabus had uh, predicted. Um. Uh, and he asked who uh, he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the, rob was, of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. Uh, the crowd that, uh, uh, that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Okay, so whether the, the, uh, the crowd have injured Paul to the point that he can't walk uh, very well and needs to be carried, or, or whether it's just they're being pushed and he keeps stumbling because his feet are chained, uh, or whether it's they're having to rush and he can't run because of the chains. Whatever the reason, they're having to carry him because of the danger and the violence of the mob. Uh, but notice at this point, OK, they're on the steps. So they're they're leaving the mob behind. They're, they're, they're climbing up the steps away from the mob. Um, as the crowd are shouting, get rid of him, just as a crowd in that very city had done for Jesus uh, 30 years earlier. The temple gates are shut. I'm sure there's a lot of symbolism in that. Um, Judaism closing its doors or that that group of people, not Judaism in general, but but that group of people are uh, shutting their doors to the gospel. Uh, but uh, Paul hasn't given up. Uh, verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? Uh, do you speak Greek? He replied. So obviously his Hebrew wasn't very good. Um, aren't you the, the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago. See, he has no idea who Paul is. Um, uh, Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Let me speak to the people. Cilicia, a very pre prestigious place and a Roman colony. It gave Paul uh, a, a lot of rights. Uh, after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowds. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. Now, I just want us just to pause and marvel at that. Here is this huge crowd of people who have just been trying to beat Paul to death. They want to lynch him. They want the, the, the Romans to go away and kill him. They are baying for his blood. They have injured Paul. And Paul, at this moment, thinks, what a wonderful opportunity to preach the gospel to them. What a wonderful opportunity to tell them that the Messiah that they've been waiting for, the hope that they have, he has come. And they can be forgiven and saved and reconciled to God. What a wonderful opportunity for us to be reconciled. And he begins his sermon not with, how dare you beat me up? How dare you, on the, the strength of false information, you ignorant bunch? No, he loves them. 
He loves the Jewish people and the gospel demands from him courage and grace. It is the message of God's unfathomable grace to us. And it's brought to us by Jesus, who is so utterly courageous, going to the cross quite deliberately, knowing what it would cost him in his body and in his soul. And he, he is given grace to us. If we are not marked out, first and foremost, by grace and courage, we've not got very far, have we, in understanding the gospel. We've not got very far in being Jesus' disciples. That's what it demands of us. We're going to hear his de defence next time, but let's pray that that grows in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pray that we as a body would be marked out by grace and courage and the gospel being lived out in practice among us as a body and in the way that we reach out to other people lord we we're, we're going to see next time how paul defends himself against the the charge of anti-semitism but we see here how ironic it was that as he was ritually purifying himself according to the law of moses and helping other people to do it that he is accused of desecrating it and as he's come into jerusalem knowing that he will be in danger in order to bless and give famine relief to jewish people he is accused of that at this moment heavenly father we pray that uh, we would be loving towards other people no matter what background they are from lord that we would recognize that we've been grafted into a culture that it uh, and uh, uh, and promises and a faith that uh, was first of all given to the Jewish people and we would respect that and uh, honour them and look to see them uh, reunite, uh, to, united with Jesus uh, as a priority and to be gracious uh, to them, but also to be courageous as we share the gospel. Heavenly Father, may we be the sort of people who turn to angry baying mobs who want our blood to address them as brothers and fathers. Uh, Heavenly Father, would your love uh, be shown in our lives, we pray, for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. We're going to sing our, uh, our last uh, hymn now. It's uh, a beautiful hymn as we, we've been considering what Jesus is like. Behold our God.